Banjo-Tooie. If I could choose one game that impacted me the most in my childhood, it would probably be this one. I actually played this before I tried the original Banjo-Kazooie, so I have a huge soft spot for this game. I remember being amazed about everything this game was able to accomplish at the time. The huge expansive worlds, the enthralling story, engaging gameplay, and wonderful characterization really blew my mind. To be fair, I didn't really play much games during this time. I've always played the same handful of games such as Mario 64, Pokemon, and Sonic 2. But this game was a huge step up over what I played previously. I felt like Banjo-Tooie took everything to the next level, and changed my perspective on how gaming has truly evolved over the past few years. So, what makes this game so special anyway? A lot of people generally prefer the simplicity of the first game over the sequel. Why is that exactly? Are those opinions justified, or am I just blinded by nostalgia? Does the game actually live up to the original? Or is it all mumbo-jumbo? Well, let's take a look then, shall we? I'll once again be using the remastered Xbox versions of this game over the original N64 version. It's still pretty much the same game, except with modern enhancements. It looks and runs so much better. I love the original 64 version and all, but man does it chug in certain areas. Feels like I'm watching a slideshow sometimes. I actually grew up playing this game first before I even tried the original Banjo-Kazooie. Though I do recommend trying out the first game before doing this one, if you want to get to know how it all started. But it's not required. However, you can get some bonus rewards if you manage to have save data from the first game, but I'll get to that later. Two years after the events of the first game, we find that Klungo is still attempting to free Gontilda from this boulder when she fell down after her defeat last game. This dude really is dedicated, I'll give him that. Grunty is still alive, believe it or not. I guess witches are really resilient. Meanwhile, Banjo and the gang are just chilling, playing a game of poker together. And Kazooie cheats because of course she does. No sign of Tootie though. Wonder where she went. Oh, she's missing? And then she's never been heard of again. Quick side note, I just want to commend the people at Rare for their musical score in this game. They were geniuses, they orchestrated their music perfectly in time with the cutscenes and based it off the original N64's hardware limitations. That's why in the HD re-release, this opening cutscene may sound off. Due to the higher frame rate and reduced loading times in this port, the music doesn't always fit well with what's happening on screen. Though this only really happens in the intro cutscene. It's a minor nitpick, but it goes to show how brilliant they are for composing the music with hardware limitations in mind. All is well and good in Spiral Mountain, until a giant digging machine suddenly appears, which was piloted by Grunty's sisters, called Mingela and Blobelda. They proceed to rescue Grunty from her imprisonment, and now she's relegated to a walking skeleton. Hey, look at the bright side. At least he lost a ton of weight, though now she has a bone to pick on, and decided she wants to get revenge on Banjo and Kazooie for trapping her. Mumbo quickly discovers that she's back, and went straight to Banjo's house to warn his friends about her escape. Grunty then proceeds to charge a powerful spell at Banjo's home. Banjo, Kazooie, and Mumbo successfully make their escape, but Bottles refuses to believe that Grunty is back, and assumes it's just another one of Kazooie's lies. So he stays behind and perishes in the process. Devastated by their loss, Banjo and the gang swears to get their revenge on Grunty, and will try everything in their power to avenge their fallen comrade. Quite a dark turn, isn't it? Several minutes in and they already killed off one of the main characters from the first game? I love how they're putting more effort into this story compared to the previous one. And now we can start the game. Even though we've lost bottles, the good news is that you get to keep all of your moves from the first game. Speaking of bottles, you can actually see his burnt corpse and his ghost near Banjo's house. Originally, this game had a mode called Bottles Revenge. It's a multiplayer mode where player 2 would be able to play as a devil version of Bottles. Guess he's tired of Kazooie sh**. He would be able to control the enemies and bosses of this game. And if these possessed enemies manage to defeat Banjo, then Player 2 would be able to control him and swap roles with Player 1. It's a really cool idea, but it was scrapped due to the lack of time. However, it's still available within the game's code and can still be accessed using a Game Shark or cheating device. Spiral Mountain has now been run down thanks to the witches and their giant digging machine. You can still somewhat visit Grunty's lair, where you can actually meet Cheeto. Grunty was frustrated with him for helping us in the last game by giving us cheats, so she just decided to rip off all the pages out of him. He asks us to find his missing pages, and in return he can of course give us some cheats. He'll give you one every five pages you collect. They can be really useful, for the most part. Is it worth collecting them all? Well, we'll get to that later. And now one thing that I love about this game compared to the first one is that we have more boss fights. 
we can actually fight Grunty's minion, Klungo, and each world has its own dedicated boss fight as well. After he's defeated, we make our way to Jinjo Village, where every Jinjo suddenly goes missing, and the poor Grey Jinjo family got ran over by the witches. A moment of silence for this loss. Yo, what's up? I'm King Jingling! The whole family just got massacred, and all you can think about is missing out on some kickball game? Some king you are. Hey, at least he gives us a jiggy and guides us where to go. A nice pet. Wonder where I saw that from. Wait, I'm pretty sure you stole it from this dude. You know what? Screw you. I hope karma comes back to bite you. Oh my. Looks like Grunty and her sisters plot to use their big ol' blaster, or B.O.B., to suck the life force out of the inhabitants of Isle of Hags to restore Gruntilda's body. She needs a lot of energy because she's fat. Luckily for us, it takes a long time to charge, giving us plenty of time to foil her plans. I just find it funny how her sisters told her to stop rhyming because of how annoying it is. Though it's probably because developers didn't want to write any more rhymes for her. Looks like we'll have to break the news to Bottles' family about their departed loved one. Or I guess not. At least we get these cool goggles to zoom in on things. And is that Donkey Kong? Remember those stop and swap eggs that we collected in the first game? If you have save data for collecting these colored eggs, then you'll be able to get various rewards in Heggy's hut. Due to the 64's hardware limitations, you're only able to collect two stop and swap eggs and an ice key in the original game. They originally wanted the player to swap N64 cartridges during this process, but due to the fact that you only have one second to swap them, the method wasn't ideal. So they decided to change their plans until the HD re-release. So what do you get for these eggs anyway? Well, you get a gamer pick. An Xbox theme. A homing eggs cheat. Jinjo is a multiplayer character. And the Briegel Bash that was used in Smash Ultimate as well. Honestly, I don't find myself using this move that often. These rewards are pretty lame. Oh, and those extra X gets a stop and swap too? Oh god, not again. Guess we'll have to wait for what this has in store for us in Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. Now that we have that out of the way, let's check out the worlds that this game has to offer. Using the Jiggy we got from King Jingling, we gain access to Jiggy Wiki's puzzle chamber, where we can solve puzzles to open up levels. Unlike the original, you're actually gonna have to complete these puzzles manually, but it does get progressively harder the further you go. There are a total of 8 worlds, each having 10 jiggies to collect and 100 notes. Notes are now in clusters of 5 and 20, making the process of collecting them all much easier. And once you collect them, you'll keep them forever unlike the first game in the original N64 version. There are no note doors, so we use these notes to learn moves from Bottles' brother Jam Jars. He acts like a strict drill sergeant, but he's a cool character. He can be pretty cold though, he doesn't even show much remorse after being informed about his brother's death. Regardless, I love the abilities that you learn from him. They range from gaining different elemental eggs, to using Kazooie as a torpedo, a gun, or even separating the two in some instances. They even get their own moves too. Kazooie can glide or hatch eggs, and Banjo can even try to carry characters or even take a nap. The extension of their movesets really helps make the game more engaging and gives plenty of opportunities for fun and interesting puzzles throughout your adventure. Now the biggest thing to take in mind here is that the worlds here are much bigger compared to the previous installment. But the reason for this is that this world is interconnected. For example, in the first level Mayhem Temple, there is a secret area that leads to the game's fifth world, Pterodactyl Land. The caveman from that world has stolen the treasure from the first world. In return, you see interesting interactions between levels. Stuff like this is present throughout the game. I love the variety and openness of this game. However, this also means that you may have to revisit some of these worlds to complete them. And you know what that means. Backtracking. For that reason, a good amount of people generally prefer the simplicity and linearity of the first game. They think the worlds are too big, but honestly, I don't get that complaint. The game showers you with war points and silos, and the worlds aren't even that big. You can easily get from point A to point B in no time at all. You can even ride the train between levels and make clever uses of it to gain jiggies. And no, not that train. Go away with your creepy face. Shoo, shoo. Chuffy's much better. The level design, in my opinion, is superb. There are many points of interest, making it a bit difficult to get lost, or being too overwhelmed by the game's size. The game has its own vision, it knows what it wants to be, a world that feels alive and connected. It's not like Banjo-Kazooie, where you would just awkwardly return back one specific time out of nowhere instead of being consistent with the rest of the game, and get everything in one go. I know it's not a big deal, but seriously, at least be consistent with the rest of the levels. Anyway, I love how detailed the environments are. There's tons to do, and there's so many events and encounters. 
you're able to play tons of mini games, from playing kickball to going on rides on a rundown amusement park. There's even FPS sections here too, which was really awkward to play on the original N64, but is now updated with modern shooter controls. You'll meet tons of new and returning characters. You can actually control Mumbo if you have a Globo. You can tase enemies and use Mumbo pads in order to use your magic to open up new areas or help you get jiggies. So what happened to transformations then? They're now handled by the newly introduced Humba Wumba. She has some sort of rivalry with Mumbo. They both hate each other, but honestly I'd chip it. There's now a new transformation for every world, ranging from turning into a dynamite, a T-Rex, a submarine, washing machines, and into a stoner. You got some weed? If you use the ice key from the first game in this secret area in the second world, Glitter Gulch Mine, then you can transform Kazooie into a dragon where you can breathe fire and have unlimited fire eggs. And you're allowed to take this transformation on every world unlike the others. The music, colorful environments, incredible characterization, and immersion has really put this game up there as one of my favorite games of all time. Despite how much praise I'm giving this game, what complaints do I have here? Playing this on original N64 hardware is rough to say the least. It does not keep a constant frame rate at all, especially in certain areas. But luckily this was rectified in the Xbox remaster. However, some of the jiggies here can be tedious, like for example... <coughs> Oh no, we got to kill it before it escapes! Damn it! She survived! Oh god, my hands are not ready for this. Can't go through this again. All this button mashing is slowly killing my hands. This demon needs to go. Get the hell out of here! I <sighs> think it's over now. F*** my life. I still haven't recovered. I don't even need to explain myself. These missions with Canary Mary is just too strict with this button mashing. Sure, it's not too bad the first time at Glitter Gulch Mine, but once you get to the final world in Cloud Cuckoo Land, well, I hope your thumbs are ready for this. Mine wasn't. I literally had to pause frequently to give them a rest. I'm not a computer, I'm only human. That's not bad enough, you have to do this four times! And is it just me, or is it even harder in the Xbox version? In the N64, I had to mash the A button, which feels much easier than mashing the X button on the Xbox controller. And what, all this for just two jiggies and two Cheeto pages? It's not worth the arthritis. And may I say, the reward for collecting all 25 pages is just lame. You get to fix the jukebox in Jolly Rogers, and it acts like a sound test. Lottie frickin' da. Just get me a drink and let me join you, Captain Black Guy. This shit isn't worth it. This is really the only main gripe that I have with this game. Everything else is smooth sailing. Sure, there are the occasional difficult jiggies, but for the most part, it's relatively simple. And you only really need 70 out of the 90 jiggies to complete this game. Speaking of which, as we go into Quagmire, we'll then gain access to Cauldron Keep, where we get ready for our final showdown. We defeat Klungo, who then quits his job working for Grunty to pursue a career in game development. We'll see how that goes later on in the sequel. We then encounter another quiz show. I'm sure it won't be too bad. Damn. She literally just straight up murdered her sisters for losing. After we finish her quiz, Grunty proceeds to make her escape to the top of the tower. But before we do that, let's revive our friends. Give them the blow. Nice, Bottles is revived. And the king as well, I guess. They're ecstatic and decided to throw us a party. And is he eating our goldfish? Well, we have some unfinished business. Time to go burn a witch. Time for our final battle with Gruntilda Winky Bunyan. And yup, that's her last name. She primarily uses her drill codename Hag1. Not too difficult, but you really need to be on edge and get ready to answer her questions correctly, or else she'll speed up her attacks. Also, make sure you perfect your shooting skills. I struggled with this fight as a kid. I never played an FPS in my life at that age. However, if you manage to get through that hurdle, the drill explodes and Grunty's now defeated. Now let's party! This sucks. Well, we're too late for the party. Time to relieve some stress. And now she's just a skull and minus an eye. Oh, I can't wait for Banjo 3. Ugh, 
still bitter about this. So what's your reward for collecting everything? You'll get a character parade showcasing all the wacky people you've met in your adventure. It's cute, but is it worth all this? Well, now that the main game is done, what else is there left to do? Not much, you can try a harder puzzle at Jiggy Wiggy's chamber, but it doesn't really unlock anything. You can mess around with cheats by inputting the code Cheeto and typing various cheats backwards. However, using them won't count you in the game's leaderboard if you care about that kind of stuff. But the main thing you can do if you have friends or family over is the multiplayer mode. And may I say, this is a blast! You can play the dozens of minigames that you've done in your adventure together, and compete for the best score, do deathmatches, or even quiz each other. I recommend it if you can get people to join in. Well, that's Banjo-Tooie. To this day, I still think it's one of my favorite games of all time. I frequently go back and play this game, even more than the previous one. Sure, it's not perfect. It has its own set of... issues. But its creativity, characterization, and design has aged really well for today's standards. Now, that may be nostalgia talking, but I just feel out of bliss when I play this game. It's always a thrill completing this game as fast as I can, and its gameplay and story has always brought a smile to my face. Unfortunately, it all goes downhill from here. There are other titles that have been released since then, but they range from average to mediocre at best. I'll probably cover the Game Boy Advance titles in the near future, but oh boy, Nuts and Bolts will surely be an interesting one to tackle. I really miss these style of games. The 3D platformer genre has been almost forgotten the past couple decades. Sure, we still have Sonic, Mario, Ukulele, Hat in Time, and several others, but I miss the simpler times. I miss the Banjo series, and it doesn't seem like it will be revived anytime soon. The best we can hope for is that they remake the first two games from the ground up, but that's only a dream. We probably won't see that until the far future. I just hope my hand recovers by then. <coughs> Alright, that's it. I'm eating Canary tonight.